21. And I'm Mary Lou Rostilski. I think most of you on here know that. Um, and, you know, uh, our network connects older adults who want to stay in their homes and stay engaged in the community. And we develop programs and, and offer services needed within the scope of our volunteers. And we're really hoping that you and people you know will become members because that's what's going to help us reach long-term sustainability and be the kind of community you want to be part of as you get older. So we want to thank our sponsors, Triply Construction and Conover Insurance, and also the Yakima Valley Community Foundation and United Way of Central Washington and the Latino Community Fund gave us a resilience and response grant that we really appreciate. And speaking of people we appreciate, I wanted to thank the Yakima Valley Museum today because from early on, maybe some of you don't know this, we met at the museum on Mondays on their, when they were closed. They let us meet in their conference room from 2016 on. We had two big events there. We had a live stream from Boston in September 2017 before we even thought about streaming things. We were live streaming from Boston. It was Atul Gawande, the, the physician who wrote the book, Being Mortal. And then as uh, Chrissy was reminding me, on April of 2019, we launched our network at the Yakima Valley Museum. They've been wonderful supporters of ours and we really appreciate that. So uh, today they're here, uh, with, Peter is not able to be here today, uh, but Susan Duffin is. And um, so in a minute, uh, as soon as Chrissy talks a minute about logistics, Inga's going to introduce Susan and we'll get going. All right. Thanks everybody for being here. We know the drill will be on mute and we're recording our session. I'll send out a feedback survey afterwards and an email thanking you for joining us. Great. Inga? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm here to introduce Susie Duffin and Peter Arnold in absentia, mm -hmm. and I'm sure most of you already know Susan. Uh, she and Peter have done a formidable job leading the museum through these closures. I had a meeting with Susan, uh, Susan at the museum a little while ago, and she showed me through the entire museum and all the projects they have been going through and working on during this past year. And I think you can really look forward to her taking all of us through this one more time. I know you're not there, but you can be. And um, this will give you an introduction that I think we'll all send you there very soon. So Susan, speak. Okay, thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. And I send my regrets from Peter. He just had something come up at the last minute and, um, and it even affects our presentation a little bit because uh, I didn't quite have all the slides put in. So we have one technical glitch in the middle of his slide. Um, but um, when that happens to me, I always say, it's just like the Navajo, when they weave a blanket, they always weave a mistake into their blanket because they are not perfect, they are not, the almighty. So there's always an imperfection. So think of it that way. It's my imperfections to um, know that I am not a perfect person, but we try our best. So um, as you know, we, we were closed for over a year and I don't want to talk too much because I've put it into our, our presentation, but um, we um, were very fortunate with the funding that we got through the federal government because it allowed us to continue working. Um, and just briefly, um, I don't know how much, um, how familiar you are with um, financial um, speak in the museum world, but um, we have two different, rev well, two different types of revenue streams. Um, among others, but one is restricted money and one is unrestricted money, um, which is kind of like operational money. Um, restricted funds are given to the museum for a specific purpose and they can only be used for that purpose. So since um, I joined the staff, we've been able to raise quite a significant amount of restricted gifts for our work. Um, Peter had a strategic plan in mind, 
we needed the funds for it. And so that's what we did. But when it came to time for COVID closure, um, we couldn't use any of that money to help pay the staff, to help keep the heat running, to help keep security going at the museum. We couldn't use those monies. They had to stay in those restricted pots over there. So um, it was through federal support and grants that we were able to keep staff employed um, and still working. But I won't repeat the um, presentation. Um, we'll get started here. And I'll start us off. So as many of you know, the museum closed in March of 2020 with the governor's um, COVID declaration. And they didn't reopen until April 15th, 2021. In retrospect, we look back on it and see that with the lemons, we were able to make some lemonade. We're all so delighted to be open again. And we look forward to people enjoying the museum and the new space. Um, we've made changes right from the front door all the way throughout the museum. March 28th, 2020 was going to be the opening of our Divergent Voices exhibit. And of course, March 23rd was the date we closed. So the paintings have been hanging here waiting for people to come and visit and we're delighted now that the museum is open and people can enjoy the work of Cheryl Hahn, Deborah Ann, Carolyn Nelson, and Laura Wise. They're all <clears throat> telling their story, uh, what it was like to become uh, a female artist in the mid 1900s and the struggles that they faced. They, um, talk about the mentors that they had in their lives. It's a pretty powerful exhibit. We had hoped to have a, a presentation by them in Centennial Hall. We're still kind of having that on hold, um, hoping that maybe conditions will allow us to do so. That discussion panel would be an opportunity for them to share a little bit more about their story and talk about their work. Of course, since we've been back in the museum, we've been enjoying all these lovely pieces. It's nice to be able to share them with the public now. We're very fortunate that the, the artists could um, leave their artwork with us and um, the exhibit will be open through September of 2021. Now, I, I want to sneak us downstairs through the back stairway um, because I think the um, mural down by the Children's Underground is a good place to start on the renovation. Of course, the mural on the Children's Underground has been there for a while now. It was the first mural that we put up. And I just love it because of the color and the excitement calling the children to the children's underground. Unfortunately, we can't open the children's underground yet, but we look forward to being open again. I wanted to take us back to the front lobby so you could see some of the changes there. Um, of course, there's the plexiglass around the front desk area. But above that and above the uh, shop entrance, we have colorful new banners 
a new name for the gift shop, the Basalt Boutique. And then at the top of the photo, you notice something dark and brown running across. That's the wall that runs the whole length of the front gallery. Peter wanted to paint it a darker color to bring out the basalt columns and also highlight the artwork that hangs there. And now we should talk about lemonade. In 2020, March 2020, when the museum closed, it wasn't clear what was going to happen. Although we had a lot of restricted money, and that means money that we were given by generous donors or wonderful foundations that were specific to a project. So in other words, we received gifts from two individuals in the Yakima area who were supporting Peter's efforts to create engaging exhibits and to create um, interactive exhibits for children so that that experience um, of the underground can really happen all across the museum. The kids can come out through the exhibits and find something to interact with and to pique their curiosity. So we have a lot of pots of restricted money but of course, we couldn't touch that to pay for salaries or keep the lights on or keep the heating going in the museum during the COVID closure. We were very fortunate that Peter was able to grant applications for CARES funding relief. We were fortunate to receive four grants um, and that money then helped us keep all of our staff employed. We did have reduced hours, but we didn't lose our jobs and we were able to maintain our work schedule and keep the exhibit work going at the museum, which was great. So here you can see um, some of the work that's going on. Um, the area behind the, behind the, um, uniform, the military uniforms, was all torn down. You can see the old paneling here and some of the old wood. All of that area was cleared out and new walls were installed for a new Japanese exhibit. And when we did that, we discovered that the floors, although really badly worn, were beautiful parquet wood. And we thought now is the time. The museum's closed, people aren't here. Let's take care of this. So the plastic was hung and the sanders came in and the floors were redone. And they're absolutely beautiful now. But this is a type of project that simply would not have happened had we been open to the public. It would have just been too major an impact on the visitor's experience. Additionally, as we set to work putting in the new Carolyn Schockler exhibit into the Gilbert Gallery, we realized the carpeting there needed to be replaced. There were burnt marks in one a section of it where a light bulb had exploded years and years ago. The material, uh, carpeting material was buckling in areas and so it was becoming a safety hazard. So we ripped out the carpeting and had beautiful hickory floors installed. There was another floor in the museum that needed attention. And this is the flooring over by the entrance to the William Wood Douglas exhibit and around through the carriages on the upper level. You can see here that it's basically plywood subflooring that had been painted and never carpeted or finished off in all these many years. So we decided now is the time to do it. We had carpeting installed both throughout the William O. Douglas exhibit and around through the carriages over to the fire uh, engine, if you can picture that in your mind. Um, and here I also want to stop and note something else. We're changing up the entrance to the William O. Douglas exhibit because we wanted to call attention to it. Many times people passed it by, they didn't realize what it was. So 
we realized we wanted to make more of a statement. So Peter called the United States Supreme Court and talked to their curator of, of um, the objects in the court and had a wonderful conversation about what the columns looked like, what the pediment design was, um, and even what the curtains looked like. And we knew we wanted to do it right. So we've contracted with a, with a company to make us Corinthian columns that replicate those found in the United States Supreme Court and the pediment as well, which will go above the title of the exhibit. And here you see Brian from Capitol Theater. We needed somebody who could sew curtains. And of course, we needed somebody who had a heavy duty uh, sewing machine. And I thought about Capitol Theater because they're always making sets and scenery for their, their productions. And of course they were closed because of COVID. So I called them up and I said, could your staff help us out by creating curtains for the William O. Douglas? And also if you remember those colorful banners in the lobby, they did that for us as well. So we were able to help them out and they were able to help us out. And here you see Brian installing the curtains in the exhibit area. We're really pleased that they turned out so well. In the back corner of the upper level, near the automobiles, we've put in another new mural, helping to set the stage for the exhibit. I mentioned that we wanted to bring interactivity to enhance the visitor experience across the museum. And so now our new catchphrase is blue is the clue. As you walk through the museum, when you see a blue area in an exhibit, it means there's something that's interactive about that exhibit. No doubt our largest object in the Blue is the Clue family is our mud wagon. It is part of the Gannon Wagon Collection, which of course was one of the first pieces or collections um, that the museum had. Unlike the other wagons, this one was in such bad repair that it had been totally refurbished. New canvas top, new leather seats, new paint job. And as you all know from watching Antiques Roadshow, when you do that to a historic object, it really kills all value to the object. However, we see it a little differently. Again, it's the lemonade. Instead of killing the value of the object, what it does, it becomes a teaching object in the museum. And what that means is that people can interact with it in a much more personal way. So we had stairs built and we put it on top of blue piece of carpeting. And now we welcome everyone to climb aboard and see what it was like to ride in a mud wagon in the late 1800s. Perhaps the most dramatic colorful mural at the museum is the Pleistocene era mural located on the lower level of the museum evocative of the Dry Falls area in the state of Washington. It depicts the many flora and fauna from the time period. And in front of it, you notice text boxes with blue is the clue on the side of them. These text box rotate, giving people information here, we can learn more about the American saber-toothed cat. And the text is in English and in Spanish. And anchoring the end of the mural is the fantastic Colombian mammoth skull replication. In addition to this is a, another component to the exhibit, which is a kiosk 
of Nick on the Rocks videos. Nick Zentner is a professor of geology at Central Washington University, and he's famous for his Nick on the Rocks videos. Perhaps some, some of you have seen them on PBS. We were fortunate that Central Washington University gave us permission to use his videos. Okay, we'll start with a quick look at the Apple exhibit. And of course, the photo mural in the back, and you can see new text panels on the wall, and the refinished floor used to be a matte dark brown, now it's this beautiful honey color. This panel text is typical of the original text in the museum. Nothing wrong with the wording, but there's just way too much of it, too many words on a line, etc. The new text panels look like this, where we've had them professionally designed using color and graphics on the one panel. Previously, they were just the photographs themselves. And of course, we have Spanish on each and every one now. Text had to be completely rewritten in order to be easily understood and easily read. And here is one of the flip panels, which Susan will demonstrate. Spanish on one side, English on the other. This is entirely our own design and concept, and I'm delighted the way that it turned out. It has little magnets in it that hold the panel steady. The B exhibit received an upgrade uh, by virtue of having a new uh, video commissioned about local bees, again, um, done by the same gentleman who did our Red into Black videos. It's very engaging, but its major purpose is to screensaver for the uh, kiosk itself. So the, another thing we added was a quiz, which allows you to go through and just test your knowledge about bees. <coughs> and the bees themselves are back and settling into their new home. This corner is now more or less complete. And as you'll see, there are multiple flip panels and the large uh, photo text panels on the wall too, all of which give it a more engaging look. This corner of the exhibit received a complete remodel. On the back wall, obviously, you'll see another photo mural, this time of uh, Washington Fruit, modern packing plant. And that serves as a contrast to the historic images of uh, packing. Susan will demonstrate uh, pushing a button, which starts the video instantly. Currently, we have three completed videos, English and Spanish but there will be a total of eight in all seven done. So this is the area, this is the area or the part of the video, which is the Navajo glitch. So you can, you know, take a quick break. It won't last very long. He was talking about the carpeting. If you haven't seen it before, you see the new floors that we put in. And all of these dresses, of course, are made to rotate. The mountaineering exhibit, of course, is just getting underway. On the back wall, you'll see wood paneling, which will form a backdrop to text panels and, and display cases. And the paneling itself is backlit, so we have a different effect on the wall. Large screen monitor, where we'll be showing the second navigation, which is not really here. And this is the augmented reality sandbox. Not complete yet, but beautifully made by Heath. And this is one of two models that we commissioned. This, of course, Mount St. Helens, and the other one is Mount Rainier. The uh, level of detail and accuracy is really quite astonishing in these models. Just before the museum closed back in March, 
we took into the collection a new item. This iron lung had been donated to St. Elizabeth's Hospital by the Rotary. What a timely addition to the museum's collection. We're looking forward to developing this exhibit even more, comparing and contrasting the polio epidemic to the COVID pandemic. The museum, of course, is well known for its adult labels. And you may not realize it, but there are quite a few in the collection. Although we have this wonderful display of Apple labels, it's nowhere near the number that are in the collection. Peter saw this as a real challenge and has been working to develop yet another touch screen that will allow the visitor to view the entire 8,000 label collection. Yes, 8,000 labels. Just by merely typing in a name or a color or some keyword, the visitor can explore the whole collection in the museum's holdings. And I would be remiss not to mention the cabinet of curiosities. Another interesting room that is full of so many odd objects. Again, Peter's trying to bring sense to it. And so he looks forward to developing yet another touch screen where kids can come in, look up at an animal on the wall and go to the touch screen to learn all about it. When Peter arrived, he developed a strategic plan for the future. In it, he had ideas of bringing exhibits that were interactive, bringing STEM principles into exhibits and making the museum an engaging interactive space. We had great bones to start with and we're working to develop them further. Whether it's the new Apple exhibit, the Pleistocene exhibit, both of which are nearly complete, the mountaineering exhibit, which will open this fall, or our new World War II exhibit, which is slated to open in 2022. I think you'll agree that this museum is a museum in motion. Things will not stop moving. We'll continue to bring new and exciting exhibits and renovations to the museum so that people have a reason to come back again and again. Yakima Valley Museum is so fortunate for the support that it receives from foundations and local individuals. We remain committed to our mission to conserve our stories, to inspire our community, learn from our past, celebrate our present, and guide our future. We hope you'll continue with us as we move forward in this mission and enjoy a museum in motion. And that is the end of my, my presentation. And a fine presentation it was. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. My pleasure. Great. So do people have questions for Susan? I guess I could ask the hours that it's open and that kind of thing for the museum now. Sure, we're back to our regular hours, which are Monday, or excuse me, Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to five. Great. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Susan, I have a question. When is the, um, the Japanese exhibit gonna be redone? Right, that's a good question. Um, the mountaineering exhibits going in where the Japanese exhibit was. Okay. And um, if you remember at the beginning, kind of the beginning of my um, talk, there was that area which was all plasticed off. So right. it's in the upper level, kind of where the mercantile was, the medical um, um, collection was there behind that that military um, exhibit of uniforms. 
Okay. And um, as you saw, we took down all the walls that were in there and made quite a large space. Mm -hmm. So the Japanese exhibit, the renovated um, story of Japanese internment will go there. Um, many, I shouldn't say many, but much of the items were on loan and they needed to be returned. Mm -hmm. um, so we still have a good core of the exhibit and we'll be re-establishing that. And then right to, to the side of that will be where the new World War II exhibit goes in. So it'll be tied right together with that. And our World War II exhibit is not going to be telling the story of World War II in general. It's gonna be focusing on how did people in Yakima experience World War II? Ooh, that's great, that's good. Are you taking, how are you collecting items for that story? Well, they did a they did a press release um, oh. quite a while back, oh. um, and um, the committee that's working on it has been working on gathering um, audio and video stories from people who actually um, experienced World War II, which is which will be great to have. Um, just last week, we had a um, members couple who live on the other side of the mountain. They wanted to come in and see the museum. And when they got here, they said, well, we wanna sit down and talk with you first. And um, they had this box with them and um, they didn't know about the World War II exhibit, but they were saying, you know, these are some of our things from World War II and we want to share them with you. And so we were saying, well, that's wonderful because we have this exhibit that we're working on. So they were thrilled to hear that. And uh, so we'll be accepting donations of um, items. Okay. Great. Great. Um, what a, tell us about the, um, I live in the neighborhood. So I received a letter about oh. the land use. Would you like yes. to explain? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe you've noticed as you've driven by, there's a sign about land use. Um, if you can picture in your mind as you drive past the museum, you'll you will remember that the sign that the museum has is kind of that old, outdated. Somebody has to go and flip the, the letters and slip them in, and you have to remember to change it, and then the light bulbs go out and all of that. Anyway, we want to update our sign outside to um, an LED uh, sign that we can then program from the inside of the museum. And we can use it not only for museum events, but we can use it for public announcements as well. So we're waiting to hear um, the result of the hearing um, about that. Um, and um, I know some, some people raised concerns about, well, wouldn't it be too bright or you know something? Um, but it's um, all programmable. So we can have it turn off like say at nine o'clock at night, we can have the sign turn off and then turn back on at eight o'clock in the morning. And, and you can um, adjust the brightness of the sign so that it, it adjusts to the time of day. Hmm. Great. So it's an exciting opportunity for us. So Susan, tell us again, um, I think I missed, I know that the, the, the artists the, the women artists who we have a vested, I have a vested yes. interest in, um, uh, we're gonna do a panel. So what's the plan on that? Is that, is that, is that gonna develop as it goes along? Are you yeah, it, you know, it's so hard because, and we're, we're really fortunate and a shout out to Deborah Ann there. Um, hi there, Deborah. Um, we're so fortunate that they were kind of really flexible about this. Um, originally it was supposed to run from March to October of 2020. And of course, we've been in kind of conversation all along saying, you know, we're, we're okay if you just want to leave it here and then we'll run it whenever we open. But of course, we never expected to be closed for over a year. But fortunately, it all worked out that um, it, it could stay in place and, and we'll run it through, as I said, the end of September. Um, now, as a public building or a museum, we cannot have crowds of more than 50% capacity here. Um, and 
for the overall museum, that's not really a problem because there's so much space in the overall museum, but in Centennial Hall, that limits us to about 50 to 60 people in that building where we usually can support a lot more. If we had a presentation, we could easily have over a hundred people in there. Um, so what we did was rather than say, okay, we're gonna try to do it on such and such a date and then have to cancel it or reschedule it, we just decided we'd play it by ear, see where we're at in the next couple months as um, the governor decides what phase we're in. And if it turns out to be that we can't do an in-person one, then we'll try to do something like this on Zoom mm -hmm. so that people can still enjoy that interaction. Good, that's great. That was part of our um, Year of the Women you know, we were gonna, 2020 was gonna be Year of the Women and it was going to be their um, art, uh, Divergent Voices Common Ground. Um, we had the um, Carolyn Shockler dress exhibit coming, of course. And then we also did a, a display on suffrage, which is downstairs in the lower lobby. I didn't include it in this um, video, um, but it is still there and it will stay. And um, one of the things we had hoped to do last year um, in collaboration with League of Women Voters was I wanted to have them come in during that time period and do a voter registration here at the museum. But of course that fell by the wayside as well. But I'm really all about collaboration. And I think you saw it with Capitol Theater. You know, I knew that those guys were un, um, not working and Charlie was great about letting us um, help them and they could help us. And um, when we did our holiday lights extravaganza, we invited area not-for-profits to come in and we um, pe people who would come would make donations to them. So that was a great um, event and I had hoped to repeat it in 2020, but of course we couldn't. Um, we'll keep it on the back burner for 2021. And the other collaboration most recently that we've done is last Saturday, we were a host site for a COVID-19 vaccination clinic working with um, Yakima Health Department. And that was a great opportunity too. We had 43 people come in for their first of two um, vaccinations. And um, when they come back on May 9th for their second dose, um, everybody who comes back for their second dose is going to get a free pass to come in to visit the museum. So hopefully we'll encourage them. Mm -hmm. But I was so I was so pleased with the turnout and the excitement that they showed of being here that we're going to try and see if we can arrange more of those uh, clinics to be held here. Yeah, Bravo. great, use, great yeah. use of the space. Mm -hmm. Which room did you hold that clinic in? Yeah, we, it was in um, the Centennial Hall. Um, we had three tables there with um, one table out in the hallway where the registration was. And then they had two tables in the um, hall where they were doing the inoculations. And then we had 30 chairs, um, you know, physically spaced um, where they waited for their um, time to be up. Um, and people could register in advance to come in. So we were never inundated with people. Um, and what the, um, the health department told me is if they got too many coming in at one point in time, then they would take their uh, cell phone number and have them go sit in the car and then call them when you know, there was room. Oh, um, but we didn't, have to, we didn't have to worry about that. Hmm. Great. People came at a pretty even, even space. So that was good. It was only supposed to run from nine until 12, but somebody came in and said, oh, I thought you were going to be here till three. So God love them. They stayed until three o'clock. So we got a few more people vaccinated that way, which That's is really wonderful. Great. Yeah. yeah. That's, great. Mm. That's great. Another thing that we do, um, I should mention starting uh, this month is we're a blue star museum. And I don't know if you've ever heard that term. Um, many museums across the nation are um, affiliated with this program, but basically what it does is give free admission to people who are serving in the military and their mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. So that runs, that runs from Memorial Day to uh, November. Great. Well, fantastic. 
Any other questions? This is great. Really mm -hmm. nice to be able to hear the background on all the things you did, Susan. I mean, I, I still think it must have been difficult to decide how big a project to take on when you didn't know from month to month how long the the, the time was going to last when you'd have to be closed. That must have been hard decisions. Well, it actually wasn't because we had so many plans in the pipe uh -huh. that um, it was great because we were able to, you know, get a lot accomplished. One thing I didn't mention that we did um, was, and of course, I say we, I the royal we here, I didn't have to do it, but um, Mike and Heath and Miguel, our facilities guy, took apart each one of the glass display cases in the museum and cleaned all of the objects that are in it. So yeah. this place sparkled Ooh. like it hasn't sparkled in probably, I don't know how long, yeah. but it looks like a brand new, it truly does look like a brand new museum. Yeah. Oh, I'm really looking forward to coming back and seeing it because, yeah. especially because I live so close and it's like, oh man, I haven't been in there in so long. Good. Oh, <laughs> we'd be delighted to have you come. Yeah. I remember giving a tour. Oh, I'm sorry, Deborah Ann, go ahead. No, no. That's I was just going to say, I remember giving a tour to um, a corporate person. Oh, several years ago when I first came here and she said, um, I was showing her around. She said, you know, I really can't stay any longer. I have terrible allergies. And, you know, with all this dust, it just, it's aggravating. And I felt really bad, but, but I was thinking to myself, you know, that's right. Museums do smell musty and dusty, you know, and boy, we don't have that anymore. It's, you know, it's really, it's really, it, it's so wonderful, really wonderful. So Deborah Ann, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, well, I was just going to say that, uh, when I was down there on the 15th, um, Cheryl and I were wandering around and, and Heath caught up with us and gave us the, the royal tour of everything. And he was so excited about everything that had, had gone on. And I just think that it looks spectacular. Oh, you know, oh, and and you. just the, the work that went into uh, uh, Carolyn's uh, fashion displays with those mo the uh, motion activated pedestals and things like I dancing just, ballerinas i think of it like a music box when you open the music box it, it is I mean, you're just standing there looking at this dress thinking about wow I wonder what the other side looks like and she turns around for you <laughs> <laughs> well and i i'm so glad you mentioned heath because um Many people don't know that we are a, uh, a staff of about six or seven, depending on part-time or not. Um, so it's a very small staff. Um, Peter is obviously the director. I'm um, director of development and board relations. And we have our front desk person who handles um, memberships and um, volunteer program. And um, Mike Seibel, who's here um, as our curator of collections, actually he's recently been, um, his title has been upgraded. Um, he's chief of collect, chief curator of collections and archives, which is a nice um, um, boost for him. Um, he's been here probably 20 years, really knows everything. He's the guy I go to if I need a question answered. Um, and then uh, Miguel, uh, who is our facilities guy who came aboard, I think he was the first pe person that Peter hired when Peter came on board. Mm -hmm. Just a phenomenal guy. I mean, he is very quiet, but if you need help, he's there right away and he knows how things work, let me tell you. So he's up on our roof, he's down in our basement, he's everywhere, he just makes everything happen. And then um, Heath, who, um, it's one of our newer employees, Heath um, Lamb. We met, Peter and I met through uh, Yakima Makerspace. And do you all know what Yakima Makerspace yeah, is? Yeah, yeah no, it's no, a real, for a long time. really cool um, organization here in town. And what's really cool for us is um, he's now working for us as our, our curator of exhibits. Yeah. So Peter kind of comes up with these ideas and he figures out how to make them work, you know? No. And the two of them together actually are really good because Peter can come up with an idea in his mind and, and Heath can just 
fabricate it. And, and that's what Peter said, I need somebody who's really, really good at fabricating. And Heath is beyond really, really good. He's an excellent fabricator. Yeah. And the fact that he's um, affiliated with um, Yakima Makerspace, this is again, another collaboration. This, the museum sponsors Yakima Makerspace and that way he can use their tools to do to execute mm -hmm. some of the designs so if you think about the b exhibit with all those um hexagon displays mm -hmm. that was all fabricated down at makerspace and the rotating um platforms for the carolyn shockler exhibit those were all fabricated down in makerspace and so it's a great collaboration because we simply didn't have those big laser cutter tools and all those fabulous you know 3D printers and all of that. We didn't have that here, but we can benefit from it. And of course, he knows how to use them and just has helped make the magic happen. Yeah. Yeah, so, so thank Cheryl, you for mentioning. Cheryl wanted a pedestal of uh, a lectern for a, a comments book. Mm -hmm. And he made us a fantastic one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's amazing. We flipped it out. Yeah. What I like about the Shackler exhibit is the fact that all the models are family members. Oh, that's really <laughs> fun. You go there and you see the models wearing the clothes. I mean, not the mannequins, obviously, uh -huh. but the pictures of the of the models. Oh, yeah. really? They're Ma all many of you're right. Many of them are. Most of them, most of them are kids. Yeah, family. There, members. There's a funny story that goes with that. Um, we had um, a gentleman come in with his two granddaughters, and uh, I happen to know this because he's one of our uh, very good donors. And um, he called me and he said, you know, I went in, I took my granddaughters to the museum and they really loved it. And he said, we walked into the Shockler exhibit and we were looking around and my one gra granddaughter said, hey, Papa, that's mom. That's my mom. <laughs> and she was pointing to this woman in this beautiful pink dress. She's, it's actually the cover of the book for the exhibit. And, and they got, and the, Grandfather said, no, 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 that's, honey, that's not your mom. That's just some other lady. She looks like your mom. The other granddaughter ran over, no, no, I know that's my mom. <laughs> so when he got home, he called his, his daughter-in-law and he said, they said it was you. And she said, oh yeah, that was me. I modeled that back in high school or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it was kind of a fun story. Yeah. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Good. Well, great. This is really fun to be able to talk about how it all happened and to get the inside story, Susan. Well, it's it's been an incredible year. <laughs> Excuse me, an incredible year, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. One we'll never well, forget. Yeah. yeah. Well, sincere thanks to you. And and uh, if there, if, does anyone have a last question before we just wrap up a minute? I just want to remind, oh, uh, Delma, your, your sound is off. Your sound is off, Delma. Delma, we can't hear you. The, the microphone, okay, there, there you go. go. This was just an aside. I think that background for Chrissy could, should become a permanent part of our collection. <laughs> yes, I agree. I, when it's she's... a work of art. I couldn't take my eyes off from her. <laughs> Great. I told her, I, I asked her where she got it because I thought it's just right for our bees. Yes, <laughs> I love the bees. I'm a bee fan. That's why in art. So it's lovely. <laughs> yeah. The pollinators. Great. Great. Good. Well, listen, I just want to mention that next week, Wednesday at seven, you're going to get an invitation to the Yakima Coffee House Poets. And I encourage you to consider that. And on the 19th, uh, Master Gardener Claudia Steen is gonna be talking to us about gardening and raised beds. So don't miss that. And then we, we have two Zoom talks planned in June, and then we're going to graduate from Zoom talks for the summer and do picnics um, in parks. And you'll be hearing about those picnics coming up too. So thanks so much to everyone for joining us this evening. And Susan, thank you so much. We give our best to Peter. Tell him I you will. Did, thanks tell for him the opportunity. Did an outstanding job. And I know a lot of us are who haven't been. I, I took out of town guests to the museum last weekend and, or last week. And I've got some people coming next week who want to go. So we'll be back. 
good. Yeah. Any, yeah. And if you have any questions or uh, any concerns, do feel free to give me a call here at the museum. I'm happy to answer things. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks for the yes. opportunity. Thank well, you. thanks all. We really appreciate it. Yes. Wonderful Thank presentation. You. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.